I love this opening. Obviously, he was going to be a dancer and turn into a rapper. But somehow he got into children's entertainment early. Uh, he recorded over 200 original songs. Nearly two of these, 200 of these, were Walt Disney Company. He was the uh, voice of Piglet and Teddy Ruxpin in Disney, not production. Uh, eventually, he, he got into a movie that I think co directed, co created two television series with his children. Bubby's voice. Last off, in the 90s, he became a frequent pastoral uh, soloist here at Valley Dead Film and eventually had cancer, many of our cancers here. Um, after in 2005, he received his recognition as a cancer, uh, as well as a master's degree in theater theater and music. And um, let's see, I think the, uh, he's been very involved in developing new works for the synagogue uh, with Elfman Sound and the Russia Elfman. Thanks so much. Now, just to be uh, sure how all the tech works here, if I turn this way, I can see everyone's faces here. But if I have to turn this way to see everyone's faces there, am I right? Uh, I mean, for you to see me, no, right? See oh, they're seeing me this way. OK, all right, good, good, good to know. I'll, then I won't have to, to, to uh, flip around. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, really a pleasure to be here and talk about how new Jewish music is created. So Jewish music that we know of goes back to the to temple times. So does anyone know uh, how that music was created? What what texts did we use in the ancient temple? Anybody know? Psalms, right, exactly. So it was mostly Psalms, and many of those Psalms come down to us today as still part of our service. For instance, the Hallel service uh, includes many Psalms that were sung in ancient times, and, but the music itself, we don't know what that music sounded like. We know that Jewish music was mainly a folk tradition up through the middle of the 19th century, actually. So around in the 1840s, uh, there was someone named Solomon Zulzer. Anybody know what Solomon Zulzer wrote? Any, there's a melody that we use all the time in the synagogue. Anybody know what that melody is? It goes like this, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That melody, everybody thinks probably you know, Moses wrote that or something. But actually, it only goes back to the middle of the 19th century. The original music, by the way, for that is the tropes. So if I were to sing it in trope, it would go something like, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. So Zoltzer, it's not that different from what Zoltzer wrote. So he took what was essentially a folk tradition and, and then kind of set it down in a new way that was appropriate for the, the 19th century. Uh, and so uh, Zoltzer became very famous. He was a cantor, and he was such an amazing cantor uh, that pe people came from far and wide to hear him, not just Jews. For instance, uh, Franz Liszt, the great composer, used to come and hear him. Uh, he was spoken about through music in music circles throughout Europe. And so his music started to get into the regular synagogue liturgy. I mean, Ki mitzion teitzei Torah. It's Shema Yisrael. Uh, it's almost exactly the same. That's from the same work by Solomon Zoltzer. So over time, composers started to write music. Uh, Lewandowski is the great uh, composer of the early 20th century. And since then, people have tried their hand at Jewish music. What makes it Jewish, really? I guess you would say it's written by Jews. Because uh, if you hear the music of uh, our contemporary times, a lot of it sounds like folk music or rock and roll. Uh, some of it sounds like Sephardic music, depending on what part of the world we're in. So Jews have always been really great at appropriating music from the culture around us. Okay, so having said that, the fact that I started out writing songs for Disney maybe seems like a stretch in writing songs for the synagogue, but actually there are a lot of similarities. When you write songs for children, for instance, they're not love songs. You know, you don't write love songs for the synagogue unless it's love for God, right? 
So in the pop world, it's love songs. But in the children's world, I can write a song about my shoes, for instance. That would be a great children's song. Or uh, a, a song about uh, uh, the internet or anything we wanted. So anything goes in the children's world. And it has to be clear. It has to be something that is catchy. That's a melody that people will, will want to sing along to, OK? So far, what I've described is synagogue music, right? It can be about any of a, a multitude of different things. The text is already provided, by the way. You don't have to write original lyrics for synagogue music, although you can. Some people write in English. I don't tend to. Um, and uh, the other thing about it, it has to be kind of catchy, because the whole point of, of synagogue music is for people to pray to. Now, in ancient times, of course, we didn't have a prayer book. So there was no way to, you know, when we didn't hand out lyric sheets and things like that, like the sheet I just handed you was so easy to make uh, in ancient times, you know, to all those rocks that you'd have to uh, uh, carve into. Uh, and by the way, that's why Hebrew goes right to left, because when you, you know, use a, a hammer and a chisel to, to write, you have to, kind of, if you're right-handed, most people are, have to write this way. So right to left was easier to chisel, uh, but there were, no, there were no prayer books. So you had to have melodies that were repeatable and memorable. The best way to remember a song, I mean, what, the first song I remember learning was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? So uh, that was a great way to learn the alphabet and put it to a melody. Okay, so, uh, so I, I decided to make that transition. My father was a violinist, so I was exposed to classical music as well as a kid. And I didn't just write children's songs, but those happened to be the ones that, uh, that, that, that paid the mortgage. Uh, and, <laughs> and so I did that for a long time. But I started to get serious about Jewish music. And now I want to um, point your attention. And uh, Fiona, if you would put up on the screen for the folks at home, this piece by Abraham Joshua Heschel. It was this kind of thinking that informed how I went about making the transition from writing happy, uh, popular, sing-along songs, mostly for families and children, to writing for the synagogue. And it's not just my own story, but this is the story of, of what Jewish music is supposed to be. And there it is on the screen. So I'm going to read it for you. Uh, it's from Heschel's piece, The Vocation of the Cantor. By the way, Heschel was uh, very critical of uh, the modern cantor uh, and felt that uh, it became too much of a passive uh, experience in the synagogue to sit and listen to the cantor sing instead of us all participating. And so Heschel tells us what he thinks Jewish music should be. So he says, we have adopted the habit of believing that the world is a spiritual vacuum, whereas the seraphim, those are the angels, proclaim that the whole earth is full of his glory, melochal ha'aretz kavodo, are, are only the seraphim endowed with a sense for the glory? The heavens declare the glory of God. How do they declare it? How do they reveal it? There is no speech. There are no words. Neither is their voice heard. The heavens have no voice. The glory is inaudible. And it is the task of man to reveal what is concealed, to be the voice of the glory, to sing its silence, to utter, so to speak, what is in the heart of all things. The glory is here, invisible and silent. Man is the voice. His task is to be the song. Whose ear has ever heard how all trees sing to God? Has our reason ever thought of calling upon the sun to praise the Lord? In singing, we perceive what is otherwise beyond perceiving. The only language that seems to be compatible with the wonder and mystery of being is the language of music. Music is more than just expressiveness. It is rather a reaching out toward a realm that lies beyond the reach of verbal propositions. Verbal expression is in danger of being taken literally and of serving as a substitute for insight. Words become slogans. Slogans become idols. But music is a refutation of human finality. Music is an antidote to higher idolatry. While other forces in society combine to dull our mind, music endows us with moments in which the sense of the ineffable becomes alive. Boy, if you can accomplish that. 
Listening to great music is a shattering experience, throwing the soul into an encounter with an aspect of reality to which the mind can never relate itself adequately. Such experiences undermine conceit and complacency and may even induce a sense of contrition and a readiness for repentance. I am neither a musician nor an expert on music, but the shattering experience of music has been a challenge to my thinking on ultimate issues. I spend my life working with thoughts, and one problem that gives me no rest is, do these thoughts ever rise to the heights reached by authentic music? It has been said at the time when no one had transgressed the law, sorry, it has been said that at the time when one who had transgressed the law brought his sacrifice to the temple in Jerusalem, the priest would look at him and perceive all his thoughts if he found that the man had not yet repented completely, the priest would direct the Levites to begin to chant a melody in order to bring the sinner to teshuva. Music leads us to the threshold of repentance, of unbearable relevance of God. I would define myself as a person who has been smitten by music, as a person who has never recovered from the blows of music. By the way, his wife was a, a concert pianist. And yet, music is a vessel that may hold everything. It may express vulgarity. It may impart sublimity. It may utter vanity. It may inspire humility. It may engender fury. It may kindle compassion. It may convey stupidity, <laughs> as we know it does often. And it can be the voice of grandeur. It often voices man's highest reverence, but often brings to expression frightful arrogance. Music gains its religious dimension when ceasing to be satisfied with conveying that which is within the grasp of emotion and imagination. Religious music is an attempt to convey that which is within our reach, but beyond our grasp. That's Abraham Joshua Heschel. So note the things that he, he says music should have. And I, I really mean Jewish music here. Sublimity, compassion, humility, grandeur, reverence. Okay, really important. And so I want to play some, uh, some music for you now. When I was first starting out writing Jewish music, I heard some of the kind of, you know, troubadour folk people that were coming up in the 70s and 80s. And I thought, it's interesting. I never thought I could write Jewish music because I thought Jewish music was all on this sort of grand scale. And I never thought I could be a cantor either because I don't have that kind of big voice like Cantor Fox, you know, perfect example has that fabulous uh, semi-operatic uh, approach to the music, which was just the, the way cantors sang when I was a kid. Uh, I, I very much remember going to hear many great cantors and thought, well, that's wonderful. I wish I could do that, but I don't sing that way. And somehow Jewish music changed and met me. So I was a guy who sang more in a pop style or a little less, you know, a little less operatic uh, style, and also uh, someone who wrote music that was not grand per, per se. Uh, so, and then suddenly I heard all this new music coming along and I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> so that, that really changed my approach and why, that's why I, I started writing Jewish music. So the very first thing I wrote, uh, I have, I'm gonna play for you now. And uh, we were lucky to have uh, Steve Perlman do videos for us for High Holidays this past year. And so he took this piece that I had done, and I, I just recorded a new version of it a couple years ago. And he took that recording and uh, set it to music. So uh, you can let me know <clears throat> if you think it has, if it is sublime, uh, or if it has humility, uh, grandeur, reverence, uh, any of those qualities that I just described. And uh, it's the a setting for Hashki Venu, which is done in the evening service. And it's really, just to tell you what the prayer is about, it's asking God to put over us the, our, a shelter of peace, almost like a blanket over us, to embrace us in the, in the nighttime when our fears rise. Uh, and, but when we need to rest, so how do we rest with all of the you know things about life that cause us anxiety and so this is the prayer that says help us to lie down in peace and see what you think here's hashki venu Thank you. 
not hearing the audio here. That's nice. Adonai Elohim. And just bear with us for a moment. Did you hear audio? So, do you think that was successful in it was a little the the sound? <laughs> wow, is it me or <laughs> uh, was it successful? Do you think in expressing a, a feeling of nighttime, of comfort, of a reaching out to God, a longing that we have, you know, to be protected? I guess that's that's what I was trying to express there. So. Uh, that's Hashki Venu. So uh, then uh, shortly after that, we started a, a service called uh, Rimonim here at VBS. And the rabbi said, well, I actually went to him and I said, I'd like to do something that's just a little bit more contemporary, but uh, maybe has a spiritual side to it. And what you'll hear in this next tune is my children's song uh, self coming out a little bit. Okay, it's Lachado Di, but it's supposed to be a fun service, it's supposed to be a family kind of service. And it actually got chosen to be on, a, on an album uh, for the International Cantors 
group called the Canters Assembly, uh, which put out a children's uh, album, and this this is one of the songs that was on it. So it's it's fun, but it also ex hopefully expresses something about Shabbat. So Lachadodi is about welcoming the Sabbath bride. So what I tried to express with this was just the excitement about Shabbat coming in. So uh, here is if Fiona's ready, and this is audio only. There's no picture for this one. Uh, it's about three minutes long, and it's called Lachadodi. Just, you know, in the Jewish world, things get around, and I think that, wow, speaking of getting around, and uh, so uh, various synagogues around the country have been doing that. I, somebody told me they were in a synagogue in Washington, D.C., and they heard the song. So, and the, the funny thing about Jewish music is it sort of belongs to us. When I was coming up as a songwriter, you know, everybody was all very buttoned down about, well, if this song gets played, then so-and-so has to get royalties, and you have to get the rights, and all that kind of stuff. And the Jewish world is much looser about that. Churches, too, by the way, same thing. Um, th there's no royalties paid. So uh, in a way, that's good for synagogues. In a way, it's not so good, because to encourage great Jewish music, you want you want to compete with uh, people who are getting paid to do secular music. So how do you do that? You know, Bach's music was written for the church. Uh, Mozart was supported by mainly royalty and so forth. Who supports our composers these days of Jewish music? If you think about it, it's not synagogues. It's great that people do our music, but we don't get make money doing it. So it's hard to convince people to drop money-making projects and come and write for the synagogue. It's really a problem. It's something that we need to address. So anyway, that's my soapbox speech. Um, so the next thing, um, uh, Chris Harden, if you might remember, was our music director here for several years and was with us for many years. And he still is for High Holidays, thankfully. He's just a huge talent. But uh, Chris and I had a Slichot service coming up, and Rabbi Feinstein asked, could you guys do something different with Slichot this year? And so we, we decided the best way to do that was to go on a fishing trip and, and, uh, and write some songs. So literally, we got into a, a, a little motorboat out on Lake Kachuma, and uh, we went fishing. And we took a couple of guitars with us. That was pretty risky in a boat, uh, and some staff music. And uh, we we spent about three days camping up there and and writing, and we came up with this tune. I, I hope we can play this video. Uh, Yona, would it be possible to play the next video for us? It's El Melech Yoshev, and hopefully we'll get some better sound going. Maybe we'll just take a moment here and uh, see if we can fix this. Yeah. 
And all this technology makes so many things possible and impossible at the same time. <laughs> El Melchior Shave, yeah. El Melchior Shave, Al Kisei Rachamim. El Melchior Shave, Al Kisei Rachamim. El Melchior Shave, Al Kisei Rachamim. Mit Nachek Bachasidut, Mochel Amanot, Amo, Amo. Marbe Mechila. Marbe mechila lechatayim, 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 uslicha, uslicha lefoshim, oseh, sinakot im kol basar, varo. Zikhar lanu hayom Bemit shalosh Esre That, that was Chris Harden's piece, uh, El Melech Yoshev. So uh, throw out some adjectives to describe that. Stirring. Oh, nice. Yes, that's great. Anything else? Grand, right? So really express grandeur. So El Melech Yoshev al Kisirachim. So God sits on the throne of mercy. So if you're going to sing that, a little folk song wouldn't be appropriate, would it? Uh, something like Lecha Dodi, you know, with a happy smile. No, no, you want something really grand. So I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you peek behind the curtain on that one for a moment. So the music looked like I was singing live, right? But actually, I, I was lip syncing to something I had recorded in the studio. So to get a really good, good audio recording, we went into the studio, had uh, six singers sing twice so it was no six singers sing three times so it sounded like a big chorus of 18 people singing it was only six people done three times and the people who were on screen only one of those people actually sang on the original recording they were all people who sing and could read music they were all people from vbs all of our congregants this was done the first year of covid 
and we wanted people to see people's faces. Okay, everywhere you went, people had their masks on, and certainly we, people didn't go anywhere in those days. So you didn't see many people from VBS. So we wanted people's faces up there. So we went out next to our uh, gym over here and then recorded each individual singer individually, one at a time. There were, I think, about 15, 16 singers up there. Each one was recorded separately, and we placed them around in those small boxes. It, so it appeared we were all singing at the same time together, but we weren't. So <laughs> it took a lot of work to do it, but, but it worked. So yes, so thank you. Stirring and grand, yes, the two great comments on that. Uh, OK, so uh, oh, by the way, uh, uh, to, to even look further behind the curtain, I don't know if Yona, if you have that photo, is it possible to show that photo? So uh, we wrote an entire service for Slichot uh, on this camping trip. And if Fiona, if Fiona has the photo, we can show it real quickly of Chris and me. Maybe not. Yeah, it's not in that folder. Well, anyhow, uh, did we catch any fish? So we caught one fish, and, and we, <laughs> we were so excited that we caught a fish. There we go. That, that's, if you can imagine that wonderful grand piece of, that Chris wrote, uh, dressed like that, uh, and sitting in a motorboat. <laughs> but that was it. We plotted out the whole service. We wrote all the music. And Chris, is, he's so brilliant, he was able to imagine all the choir parts, all the, that incredible piano part that, that he was playing while just in his head, in his head, and just write it down. So that's, that's my friend Chris. So anyhow, that's, that's enough of that. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so um, what I was getting to was uh, the next thing, which is um, I started a, a composer's group about uh, 10, 10, 11 years ago now called the Helfman Group. Max Helfman, anybody know that name, Max Helfman? Yeah? So, you know, BCI uh, was the originally the, um, the Brandeis College Institute, and college students would go out there in the summertime out in Simi Valley, it's still there, uh, and, uh, and be with this wonderful composer, Max Helfman, who taught so many things to these young people, uh, especially about music. And so uh, we named it after him because I wanted to start a laboratory for composers, for Jewish composers. I knew a lot of people who wrote, as I was saying before, there's not much incentive to write for the synagogue unless it's just in your soul to do so. And so I called a friend of mine who was an incredible composer, would write for the London Symphony, for write these big pieces that you would see on the Super Bowl and uh, trailers for big movies and also some film scores. And, uh, but he never wrote for the synagogue, but on Shabbat, he would go every Shabbat to an Orthodox synagogue down on the beach, if you know the Pacific Jewish Center down there, and, uh, and he would sing, and it never occurred to him to write something more grand, more wonderful uh, for the synagogue. So I said, would you like to try doing that, you know, for no money? <laughs> and uh, he said, sure, of course. And so then I thought, I wonder if I know other Jewish composers who would do this. So I started making calls to people that I knew from the entertainment business. Another Disney composer that I know who'd written thousands of songs for TV. Uh, got him to try his hand at writing Jewish music. Pretty soon I had over 20 composers interested in writing for the synagogue. So the very first thing that I wrote was a baruchu. Uh, and I'm going to get Yona to, to play that for you. There's no uh, video. Hopefully the sound will be okay on this. And uh, let me know, you know, Baruch Hu is the call to prayer. It's, it, and I wrote it for an evening service. So imagine the sun setting and what, what, what would be the flavor that you would try to capture at that moment when the sun is going down and you're calling people to prayer uh, on an evening?
So, so again, just to ask, what, what qualities do you think that express? Depth. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Mystery. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, because that's something we attach to the night, isn't it? You were going to say that too? Yeah. Mystery. Good depth and mystery. Great. Uh, so uh, with this same composers group, one of the things, we, we did several projects together, and uh, as Joel said, we had about 40 pieces. I have to update that bio, because now we have more, because we did another project. And the next project was something that, when I went to cantorial school, we, we read the entire Tanakh, if you can imagine, everything. Psalms, prophets, kings, chronicles, and Torah, proverbs, all of it. And one of the things that kind of opened my eyes was actually reading the story of King David, really reading it, and wow, what an amazing story. It's like the Godfather in so many ways, you know, really. There's some scenes that are just right out of the Godfather in the, in, uh, the David story. And I thought, what if we, as a composer's group, take on the story of King David? There are way too many pieces of it, but what if we got... 16 composers is what we did. We had 16 composers writing 18 different pieces about King David. And so the next video is a little documentary that was done by the Milken Center about our project writing something for King David. We called it David's Quilt because a quilt is made up of a lot of different patches, right? And so we had many composers writing uh, each taking on a piece of the story. So we decided what's the story we want to tell, can't tell everything, and then we would have assign composers pieces of the story and see what we got. And we did it, uh, we did a performance for a thousand people at Stephen Wise Temple. And so this is a little documentary about the creation of that bit of Jewish music called David's Quilt. The story of David reads like a novel. It's got sex, it's got murder, it's got battles, it's got giants, it's got everything. But I think today there's a... The story of David reads like a novel. It's got sex, it's got murder, it's got battles, it's got giants, it's got everything. But I think today there's a resonance with its politics with its uh, questions of morality. I think we need to hear the story of King David today. I studied the story of King David when I was in cantorial school. 
And I discovered that there was a lot about the story I didn't know. So when the Helfman Institute got going, I thought all along that this might be an interesting story to take on. Everybody, please take music off the top of the piano. It's the result of a very long process of composition. We started about two years before the performance. The story itself is highly episodic. So it made sense to assign particular episodes to different composers. So Michelle is gonna introduce her piece. Phil asked me to start writing narrative that will act as bridging between these different episodes, fill in the gaps in the story. The single biggest surprise was really how coherent it was. At the beginning, we set the stage with a prelude and then went into a very sublime a cappella piece. Very quickly, though, we move into this wide world of sports, David and Goliath piece. Unbelievable! So now the audience knows, oh, the fact that we can't anticipate what's going to happen makes it kind of interesting. Who is this man? Now I walk through a valley of shadows. And I find out she's but Sheva. Jerusalem Hallelujah is a, a exciting, up, uplifting end capstone to the whole thing. We were still able to, in the end, tell one single story. I think we created a really magnificent evening. New Jewish music is being written today. David's quilt serves as a model and a template, as an example, as a proof of what can be and what should be, what should continue to be. So we are, uh... <laughs> oh yes, question. Yeah. I would call it an oratorio. How do, you, how do you, yeah, how do you categorize that? It's basically an oratorio in that um, it's telling the story through, through the music, uh, but we also had some actors. Uh, so there, here and there, there were some lines of dialogue. Uh, we had the character, uh, the uh, character of Samuel, who, who is the, the priest, the high priest at the time of David, be a narrator. So he would be able to fill in some of the story points as we went along. But basically, most of the story was told through the songs. So uh, for instance, one, the piece that I wrote was the one that my daughter sang, if you saw her up there singing, um, Valley of Shadows. So you, we all know the, the 23rd Psalm, right? I shall walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. And so I gave to the character of David's wife, Michal, because uh, she's, she's never really satisfied with her relationship with David, because David loves God. He doesn't really love anybody else. If you really look at the story, everybody loves him, but he, he doesn't really love except for God. And so she wants, she's jealous of God, actually. Uh, something my wife said to me when I went to cantorial school, because I was working so hard. She said, you know, I'm really jealous of God. God spends more time with you than I do. Uh, and so now I walk through a valley of shadows. He is not with me. Right, so in the psalm it says, God will be with me, but he's, he, meaning David, is not with me. So we did little things like that to tell the story. And so uh, the character tells her story through this ir ironic treatment of one of David's psalms, kind of flips it. So we didn't have to say, well, and Michal was very upset with David. She just shows it in the psalm. So that's what makes it an oratorio, I guess. Not an expert, but I think that's right. So um, we're actually doing a new project now before, I know the time is running a little short. Um, we're doing a new project now on Abraham Joshua Heschel. 
So that's one reason why I uh, wanted to read that piece at the beginning. And we're um, working with uh, Rabbi Heschel's daughter, Susanna Heschel. I don't know if any of you know her or her work. She's written the introduction to many of his books, edited many of his books. She's really the expert on his work. And she's now a professor at Dartmouth. We're going to try to get her to come in uh, to, uh, to, to, do, to be here for the performance and to narrate the piece that we're doing. So the next piece is taking Heschel's work, particularly his book, The Sabbath. And we're uh, having each of the composers, we have 15 composers now writing, each writing a piece about Heschel's work and turning that into something. Uh, if you know David uh, and Elaine Gill, their son Michael wrote one of the pieces for David's Quilt, and he's writing a piece also for this Heschel project. And his is called Amazed, because you remember one of Heschel's things is radical amazement. So he's written this piece called Amazed. We have a lot of interesting things going on with that. So uh, I've written something that's kind of a Leonard Cohn uh, piece, if you can believe that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. So uh, do we have time for, we're, we're getting close. Okay, so I'm going to, sorry, there's a question online. Okay, sure. Uh, is it on the screen? I don't see it. Okay, great. Someone have a question here? I see Sandy's there. Hi, Sandy. Sandy was one of the singers on El Melech Yeshev. That's right. Uh, you have shown an example of vir a virtuosic music, yeah. But there needs, uh, oh, for participatory, yeah. So the one piece that uh, we, we couldn't play and was a little bit distorted, Lecha Dodi, Likrat Kala, that one is actually more participatory. Uh, our group has written some of those things, uh, our composers group. Yes, there's absolutely a need for uh, participatory music. I have to say most of the composers in our group want to kind of show their chops, want to show how, how great their music is. Uh, and sometimes we fall down in that area uh, in writing for the synagogue. It's really important. Uh, the, the reason that Shlomo Karlbach's music is still so popular to this day, I did a couple of his things this past Shabbat, is that he just was so tuneful and was able to, so I, I have to kind of rethink about you know being that children's composer sometimes and just write things that are easy to sing along with. So yeah, uh, we, I, that's a really good point. We need more of that. Uh, so are we okay? Yeah? All right, so I want to play something else. So during COVID, I was stuck at home and uh, couldn't really you know, get out in front of the congregation very much, except online. And I, there was a, a, a tune that I had recorded called Ahavat Olam. It's from uh, the Friday Night Liturgy, something that um, I had done here many years ago. I kind of had fun with this one. It's a little bit more sing-alongy. And, and decided to try more of a uh, sort of a country western flavor for Ahavat Olam. So this was something completely different. And I, I recorded it in my uh, living room uh, with my daughter and son-in-law who were uh, sequestered with us. So this is when nobody could go out and we were going crazy. And we said, let's, let's make a video just for fun, just to see what we can do. I didn't really intend it for public viewing. Uh, but uh, I wanted to experiment and see if we could make it work. So uh, I'm going to play for you, if, if you own a wood, please. Ahavat Olam, recorded in the barren living room with my kids. Ahavat. Olam, Beit Yisrael, Find us, 
even when we must hide There's a path and a guide For we are loved by an unending love Ahabat, O Lam, Beit Yisrael Thanks. We had fun fun doing that. So what's interesting about that one, there's, there's a poem by Rami Shapiro. We are loved by an unending love. We are embraced by arms that find us even when we are hidden from ourselves. It's in uh, uh, the Shiva books that we use. And we, we use it all the time because it's very touching. And I thought, well, this, would, this could make a really nice song. So sometimes a little poetry, and an, an idea, something the rabbi says will lead to uh, an idea for some music. So uh, it's been a great being with you today. And uh, so stick around for a Torah study in a little while. And on the 23rd, I know Joel's going to tell you, we're going to do a sing-along together. Yes, yes. So thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Barron. We really appreciate it. This is so much fun today. I think we should all uh, write songs. I mean, to me, music is life. You know? Thanks. In any case, um, thank you again. So we